Prophet Muhammad. <coughs> وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأصومين المظلومين. I begin in Allah's name, the beneficent, the merciful. And Allah in Surah Isra, when Israel tells us, وَلَقَدْ صَرَّفْنَا لِلنَّاسِ بِهَذَا الْقُرْآنِ مِنْ كُلِّ مَثَلْ فَأَبَى أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ إِلَّا كُفُورًا صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات الله محمد وعلى محمد. All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I begin in his blessed name for granting us this life and considering us worthy to represent him on this earth as moral individuals. And as you know, as I mentioned yesterday, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us moral beings and with the ability to reject uh, evil and the ability to promote good and the reverse, meaning we can also be very destructive within our scopes, as Imam Ali alayhi salam states. And I want you to know that when I mention Imam Ali alayhi salam, I want you to know on the record that everything the Imams say is what the Prophet says. He is the center of our deen. The Prophet is the center of our deen. And our Imams are the reflectors and the protectors of the deen, meaning that Imam Ali alayhi salam nor the remaining 11 Imams are not superior to the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Salawat. Just a quick intro, inshallah, I'll discuss this whole issue of prophethood and imamat and how it came down to humanity and how important is leadership, khilafa, and its essential nature. But to understand the famous statement of the Prophet when he says, Ana madinatul ilm wa aliyun babuha. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْمَدِينَ فَلِيَأْتِهَا مِنْ بَابِهَا So Prophet said, I am the city of knowledge and Ali is the gate of that city. And whoever wants to come to the city, enter through that gate. So when we talk about Imam Ali alayhi salam, we talk about any Imam making any comments or statements, please know that this is what the Prophet has said because they are the gates to the city of knowledge. And they protect the message. The difference is that when the messenger came, and I'll talk further on this, but a quick intro in case we miss out on this point, is you find that the Holy Prophet came and started his mission at the age of 40. He had his public mission for 23 years. Of the 23, 13, he was under subjection in Mecca, meaning he was under persecution in Mecca. So he actually had 10 years uh, <coughs> in Medina. Within those 10 years, more than half that time he was on the battlefield defending the onslaught of the enemies trying to attack Islam and to eradicate it. So the messenger actually had very few years of peaceful time by which to sit down and discuss the matter of deen to the people. But the religion is vast and there is much knowledge to be disseminated. So Allah's divine mercy comes through imamat, which becomes a reflection for another 255 years by which our imams are, are taking the message of the Prophet and revealing it to mankind in greater details. Hence, when we quote the imams, it's not because they are superior to the Prophet, but because they become the mouthpiece of the Prophet as reflectors of the message of the deen of Allah. Salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. So, Imam Ali alayhi salam <coughs> tells us in, in the hadith and in, you know, in, uh, in many, many ways with regards to the importance of the Quran and the deen of Allah that we should indulge in it and ask it questions and it will talk to us. So here you find that Allah says in Surah uh, Isra, وَلَقَدْ صَرَّفْنَا لِلنَّاسِ فِي هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ مِنْ كُلِّ مَثَلِ in, Allah says that we have explained for mankind in this Quran every kind of similitude, meaning the Quran is a book that comes and teaches us the moral argument. And it has shown us many d diverse angles using analogies. Allah has used the analogy of uh, a spider, for example, making a complicated house for itself, what we call the spider web. It is complicated, yet it's very fragile. And Allah describes the fragility of the disbeliever equivalent to the house of the spider. We find the Quran uses the animals as examples, uses the birds as examples. 
And the Quran is filled with these kinds of similitudes so that we take lessons in a moral argument. But tonight, as I want to continue, as I promised yesterday, the continuity of Surah Al-Mulk, Surah number 67, and you'll see the spirit of this surah. And for us to understand that while the Quran is a book of guidance, it is also a book of dua. It is a book of prayers. Because when we recite the surahs of the Quran, it is also a prayer. It is a means to the prayer, and you find Allah teaches us how to pray even in the surah. You know, وَقُلْ رَبِّي wa, wa, You know, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٍ These are all prayers in the Quran, but they're also instructions on what the principles of the deen of Allah are. So Allah says that we have given mankind every kind of similitude, but most men do not consent except by denying it, meaning we challenge it. Kufura, we do kufr, we reject it. And that's unfortunately the nature of humanity because we don't understand the purpose of life. If we don't understand the purpose of life, then we fill it in with our own ideologies. And often our purposes are short-lived. And once we think short-lived, then our entire conclusion is going to be short-lived. And generally short-lived or short-term vision leads to wrong conclusions. Atheism is a good example. If a, an atheist will tell you that there's too much injustice in the world. There is. They're right. There is injustice. And they will say, what kind of a God allows such injustice where children get killed and tyrants can rule upon innocent people? And their argument is, well, why would such a God allow this? Now, it makes sense in what they're saying if our existence is only on this earth. Meaning when we die and nothing else happens, then what they're saying is totally logical and makes sense. But if you extend the reality of time, that we were not created for this world, this world is a temporal place, and that in fact our existence is for an eternal existence in another, another part of the universe, then the conclusion changes. So then my argument would be, well, this trial where there is injustice <coughs> is caused by the very human being that has been granted free will. And the fact that injustices do take place is proof that we have free will. Because there are people who ask, you know, about free will and predestination, qada wa qadar, and they argue that do we really have free will since Allah already knows? And many of us grapple with this idea. How would we know? Maybe God has, you know, pre-programmed me to speak like this, to ask whether I have free will. But actually I don't have free will. You know, people get into this trap and they cannot get out. And the danger of assuming that there is no free will is that then when you commit a sin or a crime, it's just not as bad as the person who does good, which is not as good. So people who do good are no different than the people who commit murders and because it's all part of the plan. It's like a movie. You say we are all just actors. And when you finish the movie, the... The criminal in the movie doesn't get arrested. You know, he doesn't have any punitive measures. It means they don't get punished. Because it was just a movie. It was make-believe. It was a play. Somebody wrote it and we acted it. But Allah is showing us that evil exists. And you are repulsed by it. And you know that I'm all good. So that means the evil that is on this earth must be due to free will. Otherwise, why would it happen? So it's proof that free will is prevalent. But Allah is also telling us that this evil that you are repulsed by can be stopped, mitigated, eradicated through your own transactions of good. But tacit silence, meaning when we acquiesce, when we remain silent, when people are committing crimes and doing wrong things, and we don't say anything and we don't do anything, then we are telling the evildoer, it's okay, go keep doing it until they kill us. And that's the problem in society today. We tend to be silent when people are getting killed. Look what's happening in Gaza right now. Look what's happening in Yemen right now. Majority of our world population is silent. While populations are being annihilated, even in the Rohingya Muslims who are being completely shifted, you know, their, their, their entire culture is being uprooted by the, the Burmese, the, the, you know, the Burmese army, you find that the world generally is silent. No one is raising, because whatever the master, the superpower says, it goes. Whatever the mass media says, it goes. 
Innocent people are getting killed. We don't care. And then we're asking Allah, why are these children getting killed? Allah says, what are you doing? What have you done to stop it? You know, there are Irish people today going to supermarkets and refusing to buy Israeli products because they're saying they are, they're killing Gazans and we don't want to eat their food. Now that's proactivity. You know, you've got the boycott diverse groups that is really hurting the, the, these uh, evil forces that are unfairly encroaching on people's lands and destroying their homes. That they're taking action, but some of us are afraid. Oh, what will the government do to us? Even in these centers you find, for example, that's because the government wants to come after these properties and claim that some you know, person who has nothing to do with 9-11 has to now pay for everything about 9-11. And the very ones who did 9-11, 18 out of 19 pilots from Saudi Arabia, they are our biggest friends. You know, We sell them hundreds of billions of dollars worth of arms. They're the ones who brought our buildings down. They are the ones who are fomenting the most terrorism in the world. And yet they are our biggest allies in the world. This hypocrisy cannot be taught to our next generations for long. And that silence leads to our own destruction. Muawiyah was like that. Muawiyah used to grab people and kill them at will because people were silent. Imam Ali salam says to them, where are you? Where? Imam Hussein says, you know, Hal min yansuruna. where are you to stand up? Why don't you rise against tyrancy? People say, no, 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 what will they say? Even in these organizations, some people are afraid even to give one dollar donation because they're afraid the government will chase us. So that fear now, fear mongering, becomes a methodology by which to dismantle our entire good movement because fear becomes the tactic of silencing people. We're afraid what will happen. There are a thousand ways to manage these kinds of problems. And let's not succumb to the foolishness of people and the foolishness of people who want to silence Huck from Bartle. So when we see evil taking place in the world, please understand it's prevalent because we are silent. We are not doing our duty as much as we should. And I point that figure the most to myself. People say, oh brother, you might be arrested. I say, listen, it's not that we want to get arrested. We want to speak the truth. We want to bring justice and harmony. We're not bigots. We're not against people of other religions. We honor them. We honor humanity. If a Jewish life is being taken unfairly, then we must rise and fight for it. If a Muslim life is being taken, if a Hindu life is being taken, it's got nothing to do with Muslim versus non-Muslim. It's got to do with equality for humanity. But our silence leads to that destruction. And the Quran is telling us that when you look at problems in society and you're, you're, you're cringing at the evils, Allah is talking to us and saying, okay, what are you going to do? Allah says to Yahya in the Quran, Ya, ya, ya Yahya, khudil kitab bi quwa. Oh Yahya, take the law and move. You have been endowed with enough power. Our Imams, the reason we revere them so much is because they rose against tyranny. They were not afraid to speak when it was necessary. Sure, they were silent at times, but they were vigilant. They were constantly penetrating. You know, when we bought the camp in Michigan, post 9-11, people say, really, you bought a Muslim camp? Even ISNA, which is the largest organization in America among the Muslim population of the schools of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they called me up and said, bravo, how did you do this? Post 9-11, build a Muslim camp. I mean, their idea of a Muslim camp is you're going to create terrorists and you're going to train children to be terrorists. Because that's what they want us to think, so that we should not do anything positive. We bought the camp in the heart of the Christian community. You see? They we're not afraid of them. They're not bad people. I told my neighbors, I said, if you were living in a Muslim country, right, and we were always told that Christians are terrorists, sure, if you bought a piece of land next to my house, I'd be worried. You've been misinformed. And this is the nature of divide and conquer, to make animosity between us. And when we bought it, we hired all the neighbors and said, you're all working for us. You know, you are our employees. You will work for us. We give you this facility to use for free. The school can use it for free because we are active and proactive citizens because that's the deen of Allah. And I remember when I used to pay them on Friday, they said, wow, you pay us so quickly. I said, our prophet has told us, pay the wages of a man before his sweat dries. Oh, wow. Is that what your prophet says? I said, that's the, that's the religion that God has given us. And they go around telling everybody, these are good people, go work for them, they'll pay you, they won't cheat you. So what I'm trying to say is Allah has said to us, go, empower yourself. 
What has happened now in town? All the neighbors are defending us. Anybody who's got bigotry in town, the community goes against them and says, no, these are good people. We've known them for 11 years. They've been with us. And we grow and we build foundations that way. Let us not be afraid of societies. And if people are against us, even on political grounds, let's stand firm and tell them we are people of justice. And if they kill us, then let them kill us. But we have to die anyway. Salawat Allah Muhammad wa al-Muhammad. I'm simply saying, my brothers and sisters, some of us, we act like ostriches. You know, the minute there's something slightly wrong, oh, oh, run away, yalla, yalla, I'm afraid. You know, my comfort zones will be tempered with. Well, then the devil says, aha, this is the person. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy him for cheap. This is what Qadi Sharay did. You know, Qadi Sharay did the same thing when Yazid went to him and said, pass the fatwa and make it halal for me to kill Hussein ibn Ali. He says, I can't. He threw money at him, added money, added money. And Muawiyah used to laugh. He said, they are the Ahlul Bayt, the Banu Hashim. They're working hard with logic and reason. And I'm buying religion with money. I'm buying it. And today the destruction of Muawiyah's works is ISIS and Taliban and Al-Qaeda. They're causing all kinds of destructions in society. And how many millions of people's lives are being distracted and disrupted and going, they're becoming, they're becoming refugees and deaths left, right and center. And we are wondering like, wow, why is evil so prevalent? This next generation is being told, pray, seek grace from God. They say, what grace? We keep praying and more evil is coming. Yeah, because we're not acting on our prayers. Allah says, لِمَا تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ كَبْرَتْ مَقْتًا إِنَّ اللَّهِ أَن تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ Why do you say that which you don't do? Allah says, it's detestable to, you, to Allah that you say that which you don't do. Let's do inshallah and you'll be surprised. And we don't have to become presidents of countries and build armies. None of that. One on one, be nice to people. One on one. No one made us prophets. Maybe I have this platform. Most of you don't. You don't have to get on platforms and speak in front of the world. You don't need to. One on one. That neighbor, that friend, that coworker, be nice to them. Be gentle with them. Bring harmony. Don't damn them. Don't condemn them. You know, respect their religion. Show that we are people of unity. We are people of love. And we do not like evil. Then our children will see, wow, I see the true meaning and the purpose of life. When we understand the meaning and the purpose of life, our lives become uh, uh, proactive in so many ways. So let's focus on trying to understand that, please. Let me continue with this. As I mentioned yesterday, Allah is talking about Tabarak al mulk Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Blessed is he. So to, this is Surah Al-Mulk, verse number six, uh, Surah number 67. Allah starts by saying that he owns the universe. He is the master. Tabarak al mulk wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. He created death and life to test which of us is best in deeds, meaning the function and purpose in this world is for us to be morally upright, not for any other reason, but for us to earn our own uh, dignity through free will, such that when we do enter paradise, we will have participated in it rather than having been taken there. Because when you are taken there without having earned it, the value is low. But when you and I struggle with it and Allah helps us to enter paradise, then we feel a sense of gra uh, uh, gratitude and self-worth increases. Allah is so merciful that after having created us, He gave us free will and He considers our self-worth so valuable, He nurtures it, He honors it, He pushes us. It's like the parent who says to the child, go, go, run. It's okay, you'll do it. You don't run for the child. You make the child run. But when the child succeeds, the child feels empowered. And the mother feels empowered. And the father feels empowered. And said, wow, that's my son. That's my daughter. That's what multiply that infinite times is how Allah feels when you and I turn towards him in a positive way. So Allah says, he created death and life to test which of us is indeed. Allah says about the universe, he created them in seven layers. You will not find any fissures in it, no mistakes in the universe. It's continuous. Even physicists who received the Nobel Prize concluded that the whole universe is made of stardust and we're all made of the same matter. It's amazing that at the component level of compounds and molecules, Allah has created such a dynamic, fluid, free-falling system that forms into different bonds, different shapes, and 
objects appear and disappear. Allah says, look at my creation. This is what God has created. In Surah Luqman, Allah says, show us what anyone else has created. Then Allah says, we adorn the lower heavens with lamps. We adorned it and it's a canopy that protects you and that when meteors come in your direction of any form, we strike them and destroy them so that you are safe. Then Allah says, Now God immediately turns towards the rejecters. Look at how the Quran is constantly flowing from God creating the universe to death and life, to the skies, to the disbeliever. Notice it's shifting from one angle to another, but it hasn't lost its connection. What's the connection? The authority of God. What's the connection? The mercy of God. What's the connection? The guidance of God. What's the connection? The purpose of life. Subhanallah. Feel it. Magnificent conversation about the outcome of the disbelievers who reject God willfully what transacts on the Day of Judgment. I want to discuss this very briefly. Allah says, and for those who disbelieve in their Lord is the punishment of hell, the evil that is their resort, meaning they earned it. When they shall be cast therein, they shall hear a loud moaning of its heaves, meaning the fire is noisy. Have you ever been in front of a very large fire? It's very noisy. It roars. And in fact, it distracts sound. If you ever go into a bonfire and stand on the two sides of the fire, the person speaking on the other side will not be able to hear you because the fire distracts sound too. Because it's moaning. It's got noise. سَمِعُوا لَهَا شَهِيقًا وَهِيَ تَفُورٌ تَكَادُوا تَمَيَّزُ مِنَ الْغَيْذ It's got this rage. Fire is raging. Allah is describing in graphic details for you and I to understand what is the function of how God decrees His ways. Now bear in mind, who will enter hell? Watch. Watch what the Quran is saying. I want to discuss this very briefly, but it's amazing. He says, bursting to for fury whenever a group is cast into it, meaning groups are being thrown in it, the keeper of hell shall ask them, did you not get a warner? Didn't a warner come to you? Alam ya'tikum nadir? Didn't a warner come to you? I want you to ponder this for a moment because it's incredibly powerful. This conversation in Surah Al-Mulk is subhanallah, if you really ponder over it, it's um, amazing. I cannot go too deep into it, but just as, a, as an example. They shall say, Qalu bala qad jaa'ana fakadhabna. They shall say, yeah, indeed, there came to us a warner, but we rejected him and said that God has not revealed anything. You're only in great error. Meaning these prophets claiming to get revelations, they never got anything. It's a lie. فَكَذَّبْنَا وَقُلْنَا مَا نَزَّلَ اللَّهُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِنْ أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا فِي ضَلَالٍ كَبِيرٍ وَقَالُوا And then they will say, Had we but listened and pondered, لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَوْ أَوْ نَعْقِلُوا Had we listened or pondered, if we would have just paid attention and not turned our ears off, then we would not be among the inmates of this fire. Meaning the one who's entering fire is not blaming God that, oh God, you tricked me, shaitan tricked me, you see. They're saying, if only we listened and paid attention. Just this verse alone should be the template of our lives. لو كنا نسمع أو نقل ما كنا في. So Allah is saying, I'm showing you, if you listen and pay attention, then you will not be the companion of the fire, is what Allah is telling us. Amazing. Then Allah says, He says, uh, So they shall acknowledge, 
bidambim. They shall acknowledge their sins. Meaning, those on judgment day who are going to be punished, they will not blame Allah. They will acknowledge, I caused this. It was my own hands that led me here. <clears throat> That's ultimate justice. فَاعْتَرَفُوا بِذَنْبِهِمْ And God says, but far will be forgiveness for the inmates of the burning fire. Because when they were warned, they rejected, rejected, rejected. And the Holy Prophet has stated, who will remain in hell forever? The one who even after being removed from hell, continues to reject Allah. The one who's we call in English recalcitrant. One who's contumacious in English. One who rejects and fights authority. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Who will reject me? The one. وَمَا يَجْهَدُ بِآيَاتِنَا إِلَّا كُلْ خَتَّارٍ كَفُورٍ No one rejects the signs of God except one who is bent on rejecting. خَتَّارٍ كَفُورٍ Now, then Allah turns to the believers. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَخْشَوْنَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَيْبِ Now, before I go there, quick introduction. Did you notice the angels are asking, أَلَمْ يَأْتِكُمْ نَذِيرٍ I want you to ponder for a moment. Think about this. These are the same beings who were commanded to bow to Adam. Don't forget that. And these are the same beings who asked Allah, why should we bow to this creature who will reject you and cause bloodshed on earth? So they already know. <clears throat> so then why are they asking, Alam yatikum nadir? They already know they will reject. So why are they asking? One of the evidences of the Mufassirin, and I've had long discussions about this verse with scholars, great scholars on this matter, <clears throat> is they say that the angels realize that Allah created mankind for paradise. And that the majority of the human race will ultimately enter paradise. Because it's the Rahmah of Allah. Ultimately. Now, I also want to state Paradise is not one place for everyone. Jannah has many levels. The highest stages of Jannah, one of them is Maqam Mahmud. It's the place where the, the inhabitants, where prophets and imams and the highest servants of Allah shall enter. Maqam Mahmud. You and I should work hard to enter there. You and I should live on this earth to hopefully make it among the sabiqun as sabiqun ulaika al-muqarrabun. This should be our goal, not to avoid hell. Our goal should be, how can I enter the highest stations of paradise? This is the real goal of this world, brothers and sisters. We do business like that. We go to school like that. We covet successes like that. We don't look at failures as a means of our business. We don't look at break-even businesses. We don't barely try to cross the exam. We look for how do I score an A+. Plus. That's success. People who are successful don't want to go to some mediocre university. They want to go to the finest universities. When they buy their homes, they want to buy the finest homes. When they, they, when they want spouses, they want the best spouses. Everything should be for the best. So why for the hereafter many of us are talking about avoiding hell? And we're stuck in that. Sure, we should avoid hell due to our own stupidity and ignorance. But our conversation and lifestyles and our charity and our kindness and our struggles in this world should be built on reaching high stations and said, how do I become the companion of the prophets and to be at the pool of Kawthar with Ahlul Bayt? That's the key you and I should be talking about. So the angels are stunned. Why are you here? God is too merciful. He sent 124,000 prophets. He gave you the scriptures. He has guided you in your soul, in your spirit. He is such a forgiver. Wallahu hmm? ghafoorur rahim. Wallahu yuhibbu tawabin. God is too forgiving. The angels are stunned. You cannot get here. You must have worked very hard to come here. That's why the angels are asking, Alam ya'atikum nadir? Now look, this person doesn't say, well, you know, I was lost. I didn't know I was mustad'af, you know. My parents were atheists and I was sort of, I went on the wayside and I started drinking a little bit. I didn't know if God existed. You know, every once in a while I did something wrong. I brought an illegitimate child. But you know, it was hit or miss. 
I gave a little charity one day and then the other day I got drunk. Quran is not talking about such people. Such are known as dhalin. Ones who are lost. They don't have direction. Allah says there are three groups. Hmm? Sirat al ladina an amta alayhim. Ghayr al maghdubi alayhim. Waladhalin. Right? Guide me on the right path among for those who you have chosen. Not the ones who invoke the wrath of God. This group here, Alam Yatikum Nadir, Kalu Bala, Kadja and Nadirun, Fakazabna, these are that group who Allah calls Magdubi Alehim. The ones who invoke the wrath of God. Those are a few, but they are lethal. They penetrate religions, they write false stories, they create fitna, they create trouble, they are not happy with progress. They are working to destroy families and lives. We know them. And in history, some were masters. And they were such liars that they caused false religions to exist in the future. And it caused destruction in societies. Those are the ones Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about. Okay, that didn't it come? And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, who do I send to hell? with the severest of punishment. It's that one. God forbid, God forbid, any one of us is in that circle. God forbid. Allah is merciful. But let us not say, well, let me do a little bit of Islam or good. I'll go to hell for a short period of time. I'll get out and then I'll go to paradise. No, even the lower paradise relatively to maqam -e Mahmud is a relative sense of hell. Because you missed it. You had an opportunity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بَلْ تُؤْثِرُونَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ وَأَبْقَى You love this world, but love it for me, love it for good, not for evil. Because the hereafter is better for you and is forever. Plan it now, brothers and sisters. Let's not hold back and be stingy. بَخِيل, they say, الْبَخِيل, عَدُوُّ اللَّهِ One who's stingy and hoards money. What will I do? Allah says, you don't believe in my security. You lack my security. So you think your money is going to secure you. Your children will secure you. Your material and your positions will secure you. Allah says there is no security. But Allah, there is no security. Give it. Give it for Allah. The Ahlul Bayt were like that. They loved to give. They were constantly giving. There was never a fear of poverty. But they gave the right amount. Not extreme amounts. They were not mubaddireen. Allah says, Inna al-mubaddireena ka'anu ikhwana shayateen wa ka'ana shaytanu li rabbihi kafura. Mubaddir is the one who excessively spends. Oh, I just went out and bought a $5,000 handbag. Louis Vuitton. Now, why did you do that? Unless you've got a modus operandi by which that bag is going to bring you a lot more money as a businesswoman. Go for it. Well, why did you spend that kind of money? It's excessive. Tabdeer. Some people live in opulence and extravagance that Allah abhors. Inna al-mubaddirina kanu ikhwana shayati. Live rich. Live comfortably. But don't be excessive. Allah hates people who are excessive. Rather, take care of the needy. If you can eradicate poverty on earth and everybody's living middle class and upper middle class, now you want to indulge, go for it. But some of us, unfortunately, are excessive spenders. You look at the oil money in the Middle East today, they take $100 bills and they light cigarettes with it. And I cringe at that. And they have so much food that it's become vogue in style. You touch a little bit of the food and then trash the rest of it. I've seen it with my own eyes, with that opulence. And I remember this ayah, Inna al-mubaddirina kanu ikhwana shayati. Let's not be like that. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. So Quran has gone in that direction. Now let me quickly gloss to this. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَخْشَوْنَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَيْبِ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ وَأَجْرٌ كَبِيرٌ وَأَسِرُّ قَوْلَكُمْ أَوِجْهَرُ بِي إِنَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِذَاتِ السُّ God quickly shifts to the one who is a believer. The one who worships Allah in the dark of the night. The one who worships Allah in hiding. Not the one فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ Woe to the prayerful one who wants to show off. No, Allah says the one who worships me in hiding. Allah says those who fear their Lord in secret. They shall surely have forgiveness and a great reward. And whether you conceal your words or you reveal it, 
He is aware of it. إِنَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِذَاتِ الصُّدُورِ أَلَا يَعْلَمُ مَنْ خَلَقَ وَهُوَ اللَّطِيفُ الْخَبِيرُ What is this verse? God is establishing His decree. You can hide it. You can show it. I know it. And God says, and don't you know who created you? God is again revealing His Tawheed, His authority. And He is the knower of the subtleties, the aware. هُوَ الَّذِي جَعْلَ لَكُمْ Look how merciful God is. Now he shifts and says, I made this earth for you. Walk it. I made it subservient. Go take the fruits. Eat it. It's yours. I made it halal for you, Allah says. How merciful Allah is. Look how he consoles me. He starts by his authority, tells me about life and death, talks about the universe, goes to hell and talks about hell talks about the believers, comes back and tells me I made this earth for you, go walk on it and take it, فَكُلُوا right, because his sustenance to him until you return to Allah. So Allah is telling me the purpose of life and what should I do on this earth? And then Allah says, أَمْ أَمِنْتُمْ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاءِ أَنْ يَخْسِفَ بِكُمُ الْأَرْضَ فَإِذَا هِيَ تَمُورُ Will you feel secure that the heavens should not make the earth to swallow you up? Allah says, I hold the forces. The earth can easily be swallowed and things can fall on your head. Just an earthquake. I was in the Philippines and I felt the earthquake. I was on the top floor of the hotel and the entire building was moving four or five feet on one side to the other. I tell you the most precarious feeling you'll ever have. You have no idea what to do. Do I go pick, get my passport? Do I go to the elevator? Do I go down the stairs? Or do I just wait here for me to fall? It is the most uncomfortable feeling you will ever go through. And I swear, at that moment, you think of nothing but Allah. He said, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. I don't know if I will survive this. Allah says, that's the key. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. You want to understand the essence of life, the foundation of strength to do Allah's work? Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Allah says, Am amintu man fi samai an yursil alaykum hasiba? Are you secure of those in the heaven that he should not send out upon you a punishment? Allah is merciful. He holds punishment. He said, but you shall know. It was my warning. And suddenly, Those who preceded you rejected. What will happen to them? All these thoughts should be part of our thinking equation when we're reading this surah in the morning or in the afternoon and reflecting the purpose of life and putting yourself in the right position because God is showing you everything at one time. It's a three-dimensional expression. That's why Allah says we have given you similitudes. Have you not seen how the bird, when it flies, it's got its wings open? Who do you think keeps it afloat? Today our planes that take off and land and they're so majestic and millions of people are traveling at high speeds, five, six hundred miles an hour. We learned that from the birds. When I was in Africa, I watched the pelicans landing, you know, in Kenya. And I was watching them. I, I felt like an inverted 747 because pelicans, the bottom of their beak is bulged. And they're coming down and they're gracefully just landing. And I'm thinking, wow, wow, that's a, that's a 747 landing. Allah says, that's been there before the 747. I put that there. So you learn. And I watch them when they take off. They run, run, and then they take off. I say, subhanAllah, that's how I watch aircrafts take off at the airport. I said, exactly. Allah says, how much we have given you as a sign. Inna fi dhalika la ayatin. Liqawmi yu'minun. Liqawmi yatafakkaroon. God says, look at how merciful I am that I gave you all these capacities which you can use now to engineer comfort for yourselves. But Allah says, qaleelan ma tashkuroon. I end with this because my time is up. Uh, who is it that we are host to you to assist you besides the beneficent Allah? Allah is reminding me once again, don't lean on anyone but me. Don't lean on anyone but me. Uh, the disbelievers are nothing but a deception. They pretend to be your friends. They pretend to give you security. Allah says, don't be fooled by the security. There is no security with them. Allah says, إِنْ يَنْصُرُكُمُ اللَّهِ فَلَا غَالِبَ لَكُمْ وَإِنْ يَخْذُلْكُمْ فَمَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَنْصُرُكُمْ مِنْ بَعَدْ When God helps you, 
no one can defeat you. And if he doesn't help you, then who is there to help you? And, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, who will give you sustenance if he should withhold his sustenance? Huh? أَمَّنْ هَذَا الَّذِي يَرْزُقُكُمْ إِنْ أَمْسَكَ رِزْقَ بَلْ لَجُّ فِي عُتُوِّنْ وَنُفُورٍ أَفَمَنْ يَمْشِي مُكِبًّا عَلَى وَجْهِهِ أَهْدَى أَمَّنْ يَمْشِي سَوِيًّا عَلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ Can you compare the one whose face is on the ground, groveling on the ground, meaning a worldly person like Donald Trump? أَفَمَنْ يَمْشِي مُكِبًّا عَلَى وَجْهِهِ A man who only chooses people who are loyal to him and it's all about his money and how rich he is and how powerful and how many women he has he can play with the one who is upright the prophets and the ahlul bayt who didn't lie who didn't cheat who were not thieves who were not material they're here for the good of humanity they sacrifice themselves brothers and sisters imagine these two dichotomies and you look at the two God is saying, imagine this, put yourself in this position. You go and see these, these leaders, how people revere them and respect them and they stand up when they walk. Allah says, We should teach our children this, son, daughter, understand, respect people who are moral, who are truthful, who are honest. And don't take advice from liars and thieves and selfish arrogant individuals don't follow them ignore them they are an anathema they are a curse to society it's the leaders that god has set and among the non-prophets there are human beings on this earth who are fantastic role models within islam and outside of islam i have seen even atheists some of them have some of the best akhlaq monitor that and say that's the good quality i like that's the good quality that's the bad quality it's got that's the foundation of the Quran and that's the foundation of morality. Inshallah, we'll continue discussing this. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabban aghfir lana wa li ikhwanina al-ladhina sabakuna bil-Iman wa la taj'al fi qulubina ghillan lil-ladhina amanu Rabbana innaka raufur rahim wa akhiru da'wan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salamu alaykum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.